This is more a uh, paper on occupational regulation and not on licensing per se, but um, I think it's a very important topic uh, because the gig economy is um, uh, increasingly important and flexible work arrangements uh, are more common and we should think about how to regulate these uh, occupations or if they need regulation. And I'm gonna speak about a specific effect that uh, the new work arrangements could have, namely an effect on uh, saving behavior. And uh, yeah, the motivation is um, that in the standard labor supply model, uh, you can actually save by working harder. Um, and this is important for precautionary savings, right? Which is one important motive to save at all. So um, it's well known that uh, labor supply can be uh, transformed into consumption and uh, by that also into savings. So in anticipation of uh, future rainy days, uh, you want to, say, to work more today, which is one channel, in order to increase your savings. Another channel would be to cut consumption, uh, uh, belt tightening, which uh, also allows you to save. Um, so this is what is known. So what we ask here in this research is a new channel, uh, namely can saving and substitutes be, uh, uh, saving and labor supply be substitutes intertemporally, uh, and in what sense? So we propose here a new theoretical channel, which is very simple um, and works over the standard Euler consumption uh, function. So um, um, all the standard uh, theory actually applies here. Um, and if this channel is important, this could solve part of the precautionary uh, savings puzzle, which I explain in a moment what it is, and also negative fridge elasticities. For example, for taxi drivers, uh, some research found negative uh, elasticities, uh, which are not consistent um, with theory. They should be positive. Uh, of course, saving is very important. It has uh, effect on uh, economic growth, and so it's an interesting question to, to think about. And for practitioners, the question is how to regulate these new uh, professions. So just to show you that also the newspapers write increasingly about uh, new work arrangements, here's a, a, a couple of uh, headlines uh, where the future of work is flexible work arrangements. Um, and also, for example, for Uber drivers uh, in the US, they, there are some thoughts about to uh, regulate their uh, work time, uh, so impose breaks between long shifts. So uh, the empirical evidence um, using microdata on precautionary behavior is very mixed. So if, if you look at the literature, um, you find that 0% uh, of overall savings can be precautionary, but also 100% of uh, overall savings or wealth can be precautionary and all the levels between. So from zero to 100, you find everything in the literature, depending on the method that you use. This literature usually uses microdata like the PSID um, to estimate precautionary uh, behavior. Um, and what we are worried about here is that there's a lot of uh, heterogeneity that is not accounted for in, in, in the regression models and that there is measurement error uh, that is not accounted for. And also, uh, so the usual uh, discussion, at least at Berkeley in labor economics is, is it preferences or constraints? And uh, here we're gonna take uh, a new approach, namely a laboratory experiment with students where we can make sure that there's no measurement error, we can make sure that preferences are given, and we want to look at uh, behavior uh, where, where preferences, preferences are given 
and measurement error is absent and only restrictions change. So one of our treatments is to uh, relax uh, um, work arrangements so that people can choose how much to work in a given uh, amount of time. So for precautionary labor supply, um, there is some evidence. So what is precautionary labor supply at all? Uh, it is defined as the difference between hours of work provided under certainty and uh, under risk. For Germany, um, me and uh, two co-authors found that for self-employed, this is very important. So 4.5% of weekly hours work is uh, just because of risk. And this is for, um, obviously, obviously for self-employed, much more uh, important because they can adjust their hours uh, easier than uh, white collar workers uh, who can adjust their hours only after two years, according to our estimates, and blue collar workers who need four years in order to uh, adjust their hours because they are, have uh, contracts and cannot change easily their uh, hours. So um, actually, actually, this uh, precautionary labor supply should show up in savings as well. So this is um, finding from another paper uh, with a German um, panel data from the German socioeconomic panel, where you have uh, the cumulative distribution function of hours of work from 20 hours a week to 80 hours a week, and you see most of the people work 40 hours a week. So the black circles are the actual hours of work observed in the data. So if you now do some econometrics and uh, make some regressions uh, where you have risk as an explanatory variable and the number of hours of work as a, a explained variable and you reduce risk, the level of risk, uh, to the minimum in the sample, then um, you see a reduction in hours of work. You can uh, split it up in long term and short term, but you see it goes in the same direction. And one obvious critique to this is, what actually is uh, risk? Uh, and in this case, wage risk. Uh, is wage risk the same for self-employed <coughs> and civil servants, uh, blue collar workers? And how is uh, wage risk measured? We take the approach to use a backward looking measure. Namely, we look at the standard deviation of realized um, wages in the past uh, five years of a given individual, and this is our measure of risk uh, here. But of, of course, theory says it's uh, not a backward looking thing. You, you work in anticipation of future risk uh, more or less. So, so because of that, we do a laboratory experiment and uh, uh, we can ensure that it's really an, an, uh, um, future risk that people face. So looking at uh, um, behavior of uh, people, um, this guy is uh, Etienne Gilleek. He's 64 years old and he's a extreme case uh, because he's a freelance artist and he earns sometimes 100 euros in a month and sometimes uh, 6,000 euros. So he has a lot of wage risk. What is left goes to the tax office because he has problems with the uh, uh, tax office and he does not save. This is what uh, the fine print says. So can Etienne uh, smooth consumption? Probably not by saving because uh, he has debts and so he cannot uh, save. So if there is another channel, then uh, this would uh, give him a chance to smooth consumption without savings. Yes, so this is actually what is usually done to measure precautionary savings. You have a, a measure of savings, so wealth over income or uh, a saving rate uh, on the left hand side and the measure of risk on the right hand side controlling for uh, other things. And what I claim is that this regression does not work. Actually, I tried it out a couple of times and uh, it doesn't really seem to work. 
if there is another uh, channel, that would it would uh, explain why uh, it does not work. D did you want to take questions or, during, um, or do you want to just go through? If it's a short question. So okay, it's it's a conceptual question. So. So you're thinking about like direct savings and then you're thinking about savings through the labor supply. Now, how, how should we think about the savings through the labor supply? Is it that I work an extra two weeks of work and because I do that, some of that money gets deposited into my social security or some other type of state issued insurance or do I just earn more that week and then I actually save that itself? So you can just provide some conceptual framework in terms of like how are these two channels different and then like what's the overlap between them? Mm -hmm. That'll really prepare our minds for the experiment that you will present. All right, so this comes in a couple of slides, so um, um, just uh, bear with me for a moment. So what do we do here? Um, we redefine labor supply, which is uh, nothing new, so we separate labor supply into effort, provision of effort, and uh, supply of work time shift. So this means actually the distribution of uh, shifts given uh, um, leisure constant. So uh, leisure is not changed here. So this is uh, um, different to the precautionary labor supply. Uh, usually you do leisure cuts if you work extra hours in order to save more. We uh, exclude this channel. But we have the um, um, possibility that people increase their effort or if you want the quality of their services in order to uh, uh, increased savings. And also already Marshall said uh, that uh, uh, the intensity to work is uh, elastic even if the number of hours uh, of work in a year were uh, fixed. So what we show is that um, by allocating your work time, uh, uh, constant leisure, given leisure, keeping le leisure constant, um, this is a perfect substitute to savings, which is uh, consumption cuts, leisure cuts, or extra effort, right? So what does uh, this mean? Uh, I explain to you after I show you uh, our findings. Um, so here are the findings uh, on one page. This paper uh, gives you a proof that precautionary savings is important. It does exist, right? Because uh, 82 to 94 percent of our subjects uh, react to risk. Precautionary shifting, so allocating the time shift, it does also exist, but uh, it's uh, observed for a lower fraction, so it's not a perfect substitute, but it is a substitute. And uh, if you think about how to regulate um, uh, work time, so work time schedules, for example, uh, flexible hours or days, you have to keep in mind that there may be effects on saving behavior. And uh, it may reduce saving, actually. Um, so this is also very interesting because um, uh, a colleague, uh, Dimitri Kustas, found that people are willing to pay in the US $1,800 uh, per year uh, to get flexible hours. So uh, they really want to pay for that. So what is it, the conceptual framework that we use? So the standard model uh, is here stripped down to a two period model uh, where you start uh, from zero to capital T, which is the total amount of time given. Um, Periods are defined by a change in the wage. Wage is denoted by W1 in the first period. In the second period, it's W2. And what we do here in the experiment is that W1 is certain. You know what it is. W2 is uncertain. So in practice, uh, we introduce an experimental currency, namely points, and W1 will be 100 points in the first period. Second period, it will be 20 points in the bad case and 180 points in the good case. So the expected value is again 100, right? This means there is no other motive to save in the experiment other than risk, right? 
In survey data, you have problems of separating the different motives to save, old age saving, or precautionary saving, or entrepreneurial saving, uh, and lots of other uh, motives that you might have are difficult to distinguish. We can control this in the experiment. So um, these wages are exogenous here. That's uh, our assumption. And um, this has two treatments, this uh, standard model. One is people do not smooth intertemporally. Um, actually, we impose that, so people cannot uh, save or uh, do the shifting. Um, so they have to eat what they earn. So they're kind of hand-to-mouth uh, um, persons. The second treatment is a direct test of the standard precautionary savings model where people can save after um, half of the time is over. We have in practice uh, 360 seconds and after 180 seconds uh, there is a savings screen where you can save. The extended model uh, is the channel that allows uh, uh, labor supply and savings to be substitutes. Um, namely here, we distinguish between periods and shifts. So the period is defined by the change from W1 to W2, which is exogenous and always the same. Uh, the shift is a choice. The shift uh, is the choice uh, when to stop one shift. And um, this blue uh, area here shows um, when the person stops early, before 180 seconds, um, then it will work less time under the certain wage and uh, more time under the uncertain wage, um, plus the certain wage. So by choosing um, the distribution of work time, you can um, make uh, the average wage endogenous. Not only the average wage, but also the riskiness of the wage, because if you work under the safe wage for, uh, for a time and evaluate um, that together with the uncertain rate, then you have a better chance to not uh, drop so much down in terms of uh, payoff, which is con equivalent to consumption in, uh, in the standard models. So uh, during this time, you provide effort. You earn income, and at the end of the shift, uh, there is a progressive tax function that uh, is uh, like a concave utility function at which uh, your income is valuated. So you choose the point of valuation. And here, uh, the valuation, the progressive tax function goes over all of this. All right, so this is all the treatments in the uh, overview. So from the standard model, we have uh, the choices of uh, uh, effort in each shift, shift one and two. Uh, in the precautionary savings model, we have effort and the choice of how much to save. So make cuts on your income in the first uh, shift and move it to the second shift. The third um, treatment is the shifting channel where you cannot save, but you can do the shifting. So what is the shifting in, in practice? What is an example? You can think of uh, tax avoidance. So self-employed can um, move income from one fiscal year to another, and this is this, what is described by this behavior, actually. So there is uh, recent evidence from Swiss uh, tax holidays that uh, people do not actually adjust their work hours, which are constant here as well, um, but they uh, shift income from one year to another especially self-employed, but also uh, employees can uh, move bonuses, for example, from one year to another. So this is the uh, theoretical description of this uh, channel. The last uh, treatment allows everything. So you have uh, less regulation here. Yeah, you can have more choices. All right, so how do you earn in the experiment. This is a screen of a real effort task that we used. We have uh, four columns where uh, balls are uh, falling down randomly and you have a green tray 
uh, in order to catch uh, the balls by clicking on left or right. And clicks are costly, and that's the beauty of this uh, thing because you can control the costs of effort. In survey data, a person might work harder and it's easy for him or her, and another person has uh, a different cost function, and here we can control for this. Um, here you see um, the marginal cost of the next ball caught, and here you see the marginal weight, which is 100 points. Um, you also see how much, in terms of euro, you can take away out of the experiment already when you catch the ball. So this is shown in real time. And uh, you have six minutes and uh, they run down. Here you can change the shift. So if you click this, you uh, switch to the next uh, shift. Theory is very simple that is behind this. So this is the payoff function, the progressive text function uh, is denoted by C. Um, this is a lock, shifted uh, lock function. So we switch off increment substitution effects uh, the coefficient of relative risk aversion is um, one, which is very nice, and uh, the coefficient of relative prudence is two. Prudence is very important, so be, before we hear about risk aversion, but risk aversion alo alone um, actually does not uh, lead you to do actions. Um, um, you just don't like risk, but you don't do uh, something against it. You need prudence, so the third derivative of the utility function has to be positive in order to act against risk. And um, this is uh, induced here. And in practice, you can think of uh, that the rate at which marginal utility increases is uh, higher when you, uh, consumption is low than when it's high. Right? So, so you hurt more if you're poor. Right? The maximization problem is uh, pretty standard. So we have uh, the progressive tax function evaluated uh, with the income of the first shift, which is certain. And um, for the second uh, shift, it's uncertain. So we have an expectation. The budget constraint is what uh, is different. So the standard case is where t is equal to uh, a half, so 50%. But if you choose t to be less than 0 0.5, which is uh, what you would choose if you're prudent, then you work under wage uh, W1, the certain wage, uh, in the first shift. And in the second shift, you work, work under the certain wage plus uh, the uncertain wage. So the certain wage is 100 points. The uncertain is uh, a mean uh, preserving shift by plus minus 80, so we have 20 and 180 points with equal probability. And the people know that, but they don't know uh, which um, wage they are working under. So in the case where wage is uncertain, you see here the 20 and here the 180, and you have to uh, catch the balls. Why do we do that? We do that in order to isolate the effects of uh, uh, risk because if you already know what uh, realization you get, you would uh, behave differently. Um, all right, S is savings, um, and this is the cost function. So on the horizontal line, you see uh, how many clicks um, cost how much. So if you click more, there's a quadratic function which is uh, rounded, so it gets a bit uh, wiggly. Um, so you, you have uh, a point where you don't want to provide more effort. Um, the ability to catch balls is a free parameter that we estimate from the data by uh, having um, a regression of this function um, that, that I show you later the results. So how does the problem look like? So in the hand-to-mouth treatment where you cannot save or shift, it's uh, just a static uh, consumption model, actually. Uh, in the precautionary savings treatment, you have the intertemporal budget constraint here, all pretty standard. In the extended model, it looks very uh, cumbersome, but if you solve that, you end up with uh, 
the same optimality conditions as in the standard precautionary saving model. So you have um, two in the hand-to-mouth model that tell you how much to uh, work, how much effort to provide, and you have an additional one, uh, which is the Euler equation in the uh, treatments two, three, and four. This is the ex experimental procedure. I, I will not go too much into the details. We have 192 subjects. Um, we have no interest uh, rates. We have no discounting um, because it takes only one hour and a half. Uh, um, and people um, might not discount like uh, uh, with uh, looking forward for next year. Uh, we make sure that people do not learn uh, better playing that game um, by having three trial periods where we uh, introduce step by step the cost function and the payoff function, the progressive payoff uh, function. And uh, we ask after running the treatments, uh, subjective questions on risk preferences and uh, prudence and uh, demographics. Um, the experiments were run in Potsdam, where my co-author Andreas Orland is uh, um, at, and um, people got paid by picking one uh, trial round randomly, one of the four treatment rounds, and with 5% chance one of the risk aversion question because you could earn uh, a lot of money there. So at the end, you got all the payoffs revealed and uh, you could earn uh, 15 euro for the 90 minutes on average, but at max uh, 66 euro. All right. This is the saving screen. So after you finish your first work shift, you see this screen if you're allowed to save. You cannot borrow, so zero is here uh, the lower, lower point on the slider, and uh, the maximum point is what you earned. You can think about what to choose by moving the uh, point on the slider, and you see the uh, resulting uh, euro um, earnings in the first uh, shift here, and you can then uh, right here in the text box what you actually want to save and click OK. So you can reconsider, you have a bit more time to do that. These are the questions uh, on subjective preferences. Uh, we ask them lottery questions where you have, uh, where you roll the dice and uh, with, if, the, if the outcome is a one, two or three, you get 20 euro. If it's a four, five, six, you get also 20 euro. So this is safe. Here it's not the same, here it's five euros and 65 euros, and we vary the numbers in order to find the point where people switch and choose not the lottery, but the safe choice. We do the uh, similar things, questions for prudence, which uh, we, for which we use combined lotteries, um, and people can choose the options uh, left or right. All right. So. What is it that we want to test here? We want to test the uh, standard precautionary um, savings model and see whether precautionary savings exist. But before that, we have hypothesis number one, which uh, claims that there is a direct reduction of risk. And if you, if you uh, remember economics, uh, um, I don't know if it's economics 101 in Germany, it's uh, uh, in finance, Jensen's inequality uh, is what is driving this hypothesis number one. So this uh, says, do people react uh, or behave according to Jensen's inequality or does the model already fail here? The second hypothesis looks at the existence of precautionary saving. Does it exist? Remember, the empirical literature showed um, there is 0% of precautionary savings, or there is 100%, which uh, uh, Kajeti showed um, with uh, the method of simulated moments uh, over much of the life cycle. Then we have uh, absence of precautionary effort. So like in the real world or in other papers, uh, providing 
more hours of work by leisure cuts, you can also um, uh, provide extra effort in order to save more. Um, if you have a model where effort costs and uh, benefits of effort are additively separable. We have here um, a direct deduction of uh, effort costs from the benefits of uh, uh, effort, so of uh, the earnings, so that you don't have precautionary effort. So the prediction of the model is there is no precautionary effort. Hypothesis three is that there exists precautionary shifting so that people really do the tax avoidance uh, uh, thing in order uh, to save money here. So um, that it will be equivalent actually to saving. This is the fourth prediction. Uh, saving and uh, tax avoidance are perfect um, uh, substitutes or shifting. Uh, and this is the substitution line. So you see here on the horizontal line, uh, the fraction of time uh, worked in each work shift. And uh, you can have the same payoff if you don't save, like if you save and are restricted. This is the data. So here you have expected payoff from zero to uh, 15 uh, euro. And uh, in the first treatment, people pile up here because they are restricted. Work time is regulated and you cannot save. In the second treatment, if you save too little, you lose money. If you save too much, you lose money. In the third treatment, uh, if you stay here at the regulation, you lose money. If you are here, you lose money and here as well. Here it's good. And this line, the substitution line, is visible if you overlay this over here a bit. So you can also look at the data uh, in a different perspective. So here you have the number of clicks that you make and the payoff in euro and the orange circles are the guys who are in shift one and if they move to shift two, uh, they're gonna be blue diamonds and the, and the uh, grayish line is uh, uh, payoff if you catch three balls per movement. So what happens after 50, 60, 70, seconds is that some people click too much and fall down, other people follow this line, so, and lots of people already switch to work shift two. This is the first period. Uh, second period, every person has a mirror image because either it earns 20 or 180, and if you don't save, you're at the lower border of this uh, yellowish line, so you really are hurt by not saving, and if you save, you, you get much better. In a good case, saving doesn't matter so much. So if you move that forward, you see lots of people are on, on this line and uh, consume quite uh, according to theory. So is Jensen's inequality, does it uh, work in this model or not? Here you see uh, that uh, indeed there's smaller effort in uh, in the second work shift and in the first work shift uh, in this distribution, the bars here are the medians. Does precautionary saving exist? Yes, it does exist. It's uh, on median in the treatment where you can only save, it's 2,000 point, points, but the distribution is huge. It's just one level of risk. So what you do in the regressions is that you change the level of risk and look at uh, hours or uh, savings and um, you're gonna just move this distribution and you cannot identify anything by doing that. Why? Because also 20% or so almost 10% or more than 10% of the subjects did not save at all even though they lost money. So these people uh, follow a behavioral strategy that is uh, to ignore risk. Right, so they've simplified the model by just ignoring risk. If you look at precautionary effort, is it there or not? The distributions overlay very nicely and the medians as well. Um, shifting doesn't work so well, so we see a little bit of uh, uh, ending the shift early in the treatment where you cannot save, but if you can save, we don't see that. 
But we see two humps. Some people uh, behave optimally and some people follow restrictions. So here is uh, the within perspective. If the precautionary saving model uh, works, everybody should be below the 45 uh, uh, degree line. So if savings and um, shifting are substitutes, and they do. It doesn't look that good for, for uh, shifting, but uh, most people are here in that area, which it would be optimal. So you see here uh, that there are some people who were uh, according to the theoretical predictions, but lots of people uh, assume that there is a the standard model uh, in work, so they abstract from risk and uh, do not save at all, or uh, just uh, use the standard rest restrictions and do not adjust their uh, behavior, which means that they are not perfect substitutes. This slide just shows that everything is statistically sound, and uh, this, this is a regression of the euro earnings, because one uh, prediction was that in treatments two, three, and four, the euro earnings should be the same if there's perfect substitutes, saving and shifting, and they're not. Here is what you would do if you would uh, use survey data. So you would do a comparison of treatments, treatment two compared to treatment one, and you find positive precautionary savings. This is uh, using subject fixed effects. What is all you can do in survey data in order to get rid of heterogeneity, or uh, at least the standard, standard way to do that. And you find also evidence for uh, shifting here. If you, uh, one thing that you cannot do in real world data is to observe the same person working in the same occupation under certainty and under uncertainty. In this experiment, we can do that, and we find that uh, if you can just save, you save close to optimal. And uh, if you can just shift, those who actually do follow this behavior save optimally. But if you can do both, they oversave. All right. Um, last uh, slides before I conclude. Um, we use the extended model to predict behavior, and we it works quite well. So without uh, any uh, sophisticated uh, things. We just predict behavior from, from the ability function that we estimated, and uh, we can uh, estimate balls caught in both periods quite well. Uh, the movements are, over, um, are under predicted, so people move more than they should. Um, savings are predicted uh, very well. Uh, the shifting is uh, overpredicted by the model. So overall, the model works quite well. And uh, at Berkeley, uh, I learned that there is a discussion which, which model is the right one, the static model or the intertemporal. And uh, what our conclusion is, is that both models are right. There are just two kinds of behavioral strategies that people follow. Some people, uh, or most people follow the precautionary savings uh, model uh, and also do a shifting. And there are also substitutes, but others uh, behave like they're in a world without any risk. And um, this guy is one uh, who cannot save, but is probably here. So the final conclusion is that uh, in, in order to identify these people uh, these different kinds of behavior in real-world data, you need uh, information on shifts and on shift-specific wages uh, in addition to period-specific wages. That's all. Thanks. <laughs>